Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel. Chapter 21. This is part two of the message I started about three weeks ago. I think the title was Denying Jesus, What Does That Mean? That was part one. This is the continuation of that message. I'm starting in 1 Samuel, an Old Testament story concerned David and his act of insanity. So if you go to 1 Samuel 21 verse 10, it reads, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? They, did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul had slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands? They were celebrating David's accomplishments in war. Remember, this is the David that defeated Goliath with one smooth stone and a slingshot. He killed Goliath the giant, the Philistine champion. And now David's on the run, Feel fearful for his life. And where does he go? To his arch enemy's territory. And they recognize him. At least they thought they recognized him. They recognize his appearance. They recognize his appearance, but they also know about his reputation. Saul killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And David led up these words, or laid up these words in his heart, and was sore afraid. And was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And what did he do? Verse 13, and he changed his behavior before them and veined himself mad in their hands and scrabbled <clears throat> or made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his head. I mean, on his beard, excuse me. This is the David that's already written many songs to God. This is the David that stood up to the enemy when the rest of Israel were cowering in fear. This is the David that didn't want his God insulted by the uncircumcised Philistine. What happened to him? He went from a place of honor and admiration to now acting as a madman, scratching at the gates while spittles coming down his beard. He looks like a lunatic. What happened to David? Where did his trust go in God? Why did he run to the enemy's territory? 
where he can be recognized. If anything, I would run the opposite way. He's fearful for his life. He's brought, broke that trust connection for, that he had with God. And I'm not going to all the back reasons. The point of this is to show, shows you, to show you that this could happen to anyone at any time. Where that trust connection breaks to whatever degree. Maybe it won't be as bad as this story and what David did, but it does happen. David changed his behavior before this Philistine king who then said in verse 14 then said Achish unto his servants lo ye see this man is mad wherefore then have ye brought him to me have I need of a madman that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence shall this fellow come into my house so they got rid of him. And this is where he escaped. And he found himself in the cave of Dullam. Where he wrote many psalms. As he. Ran back to the Lord. Ran back to the Lord's strength and developed a small army and it was the beginning in this case restoration of a sound mind that start relying on God once again through his trials and tribulations remember he's already anointed king before this event ever happened The question is, did God ever leave him? Did God ever desert him? Even when he broke the trust he had in God, did God separate himself from David? You have too many Christians that walk around saying, well, if your trust and if your faith is broken, God is displeased with you, and He's not with you. Now, I'm generalizing that statement. It could be said in many different ways, craftily. That makes that same point. Did God leave David? Because he was not only fearful, but he probably was shameful that he lined up with the God of Israel. Somehow, I could see it in David's mind, the gear spinning in there. Well, God, where are you now? How in the world did I wind up here in the Philistine territory. Out of all places. Why here? And look what I'm doing. I'm sure bringing shame to your name. By acting the way I'm acting. As a crazy person. as your representative. Most people, if they were God, would say, you know, David, you're done. I want no part of you. But that's not what God does. Unfortunately, there's still preachers that preach. Go to Romans 10. Based on one scripture, 
Romans 10 verse 11 that reads, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now there's still preachers that preach this verse that don't do a bit of studying God's word and dig it in. That go around still saying that if you're ashamed of Jesus, you're not saved. So basically, if you act anything like or similar to what David acted like, God wants no part of you. And you're not saved. See, I'm on a mission. Brick by brick to break down the wall of this condemnation business. I'm here to tell you, if you hear preachers or read material that states such a thing, consider it it trash. Because Romans 10.11 is quoting from Isaiah 28.16. Go there. 28.16 reads, He that believeth, the latter part of that verse, shall not make haste. Or right in the, your margins, shall not suddenly have to f flee from an attack. Shall not suddenly have to flee from an attack. That's what this verse says and means. And why was reference in Romans 10, 11? I'm back in Romans 10, 11. You don't have to put that up again. For the scripture saith, the scripture being, being, being 28, 16 in Isaiah, whosoever shall believe on him shall not be ashamed. There's nothing to do about being ashamed of, of Jesus. It doesn't say who's ashamed of Jesus not saved. I don't think I gave you, the, well, I'll come back to it at the end maybe. What it means that whoever believes on Jesus as your Lord and Savior will not be disappointed. That's what it means. Not that other garbage that I mentioned a few moments ago. Throughout God's Word, When we trust Him, and even times when we slip and we break that connection, Jesus is going to be there. He will not desert us, and He will not let us down. He makes good on His promises. And what did he say? You go into Romans 10, 13. I don't think I gave you that verse, but I'll just read it. For whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what my verse says here. My Bible says. Jesus means what he says. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's an unbelievable promise for such frail individuals as human beings. He will not let us down. Just because 
And this is going to shock some of you out there. Because you think you already know everything about Jesus. But when you are a biblical detective, and you start piecing all the stories together, you see a pattern. That's why I don't scripture pick and over super spiritualize things. Just because a person is ashamed of Jesus, if you find yourself in that condition, like David was with God. It does not mean that you're not a believer. And it doesn't mean that you're no longer saved. When you think about it, when you start piecing all the stories together, wasn't Peter ashamed of Christ? To the point where he three times denied and cursed the name of Jesus. Every single disciple, maybe outside of John, was scared. And at Jesus' greatest need, all deserted him. They forsook Christ while he was being scourged and crucified. Now that is grounds for never to be saved ever and with any opportunity to becoming saved again. If I heard of, heard of any. I mean, that's it. You're done, my friend. When I need you the most, you abandoned me. If I was Jesus. But thank God I'm not. Go to John. I didn't give you this verse either. I'm changing this as I go. John 19. Yes, verse 38. This is the story of Joseph Amarthea. He was a secret believer. And it says in John 19, verse 38. And after this, Joseph Amarthea, being a disciple, a disciple of who? Of Jesus. But secretly for fear. Of the Jews. He sought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus secretly. These same self-righteous individuals that say that, well, if you're ashamed of Jesus, you're not saved, would criticize Joseph Marathea, a disciple of Jesus. It would criticize and condemn all the disciples, maybe outside of John is the only one, with no opportunity to ever be saved again. He feared for his life, Joseph and Arthea. They were all afraid, afraid. And that brought them to a place where they were ashamed. To be identified out of fear with Jesus. Just picture it now. Well, look what happened to Jesus. We're going to be quiet about this. We're not going to tell anyone. How dare we? We're in fear of our lives. The question tonight is, were they still saved? No. You probably know people. Maybe it's happened to you. You feel embarrassed 
Or maybe you just get harassed and rejected because your beliefs in Jesus in the past, so you now maybe have a different job and you don't want your co-workers or maybe even your family or some of your friends to know about your relationship with Christ. So you become reluctant to bring up Christ to them and what he's done for you. In a sense, it's the same type of fear as the disciples have. No difference. Did that, does, does that mean that they weren't saved? Does that mean that you are not saved? If you experience those kind of things in your life? And maybe you're not so ready as you think you are and equipped to deal with that kind of situation? Of course, you know what the answer is. Of course not. They were still saved and you are still saved. You think Peter lost his salvation when he cursed and denied Christ? Ask yourself that question tonight. Do you think Peter lost his salvation when he denied and cursed Christ? If anything, he lost his inner peace. You read through the gospel story, Peter later that evening bitterly wept. And later he asked God to forgive him. See, thank God he's God because he knows that we are only human. I don't think I gave you this verse either, but I'm going to go to it. In fact, I know I didn't. Psalm 103. Three fourteen. For he knoweth our frame. And this is verse comes after Psalm 103 12, which I preached on before. As far as the east from the west, so far, so hath he removed our transgressions from us. And the 14th verse reads, For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth. I want you to remember this. He remembereth that we are dust. For he knoweth our frame, and he remembereth that we are dust. Now that's amazing truth right there. What it's saying in this verse that God never has forgotten that I am made of the dust of the earth. And because of sins, I am full of flaws and imperfections. Thank God He is patient and long-suffering. The wonderful thing about God, He knows us better than... <clears throat> My leg's going to sleep. He knows us better than we do. If God is long-suffering with the unsaved folk out there, how much more patient he is with us. Because we are his own. 
we belong to him. We have now are part of that joint heir family genealogy. <clears throat> so, yes, if he's long-suffering and patient with the unsaved, just imagine what he's with us. I don't know who you are and where you're at in your walk with Jesus. I just know where I'm, I'm at. I know I'm not able to live a perfect life. I strive for completion through the understanding of His Word and His Holy Spirit that dwells in me to hopefully week by week become more of a completed person but never be completed totally down here. Because I know what I'm warring with. This human body, this earthly tent, it's always at war. War with the sinful flesh, war with Satan, the world, and the flesh. That understands that the only way they will be defeated daily and it's a constant battle. It's through the strength and power of the Holy Spirit that's in me. That's provided by our Savior. I ask every day for God to keep me from temptation. But understanding that when I do fall. That I'm just made of the dust of the earth. And I'm incapable of being perfect. Sorry to break that news to you. Maybe you have a different opinion of me now. And maybe you'll watch somebody else that is Mr. Perfect. I'm not it. And I got news for you. You're not it either. You're not perfect. I just ask God to show me the weaknesses that I have. So I could study God's word and pray about him. Because that's what I want him to work on. But he knows better than I do what I need. But just in case he does point it out to me. I want to communicate to him that he's the potter. I'm the clay. To keep molding away. I'm not saying we have permission to sin. So don't twist my words. I think we should strive to be a total complete vessel that Christ us wants, to be, wants us to be. We've got to keep pressing towards that mark. But at the same time realizing that I'll never be perfect in this life. That's the great dilemma in a believer's life. I might have gave you this verse. Let me see my list here. Yes, I did. Romans 7, 19, 20, 7, 19. Let's go to Romans 7. Because you see that struggle, what I just explained to you the last few moments, in Paul's life. We've been there before. Chapter 7. Verse 19. For the good that I would do, for the good that I would, I do not. That's how it should read. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Let's read that again. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. One more time. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. This is from 
Apostle Paul. The individual that wrote two-thirds approximately of the New Testament. The champion of faith of the New Testament. Does he sound like he's in control there? Of what he's warring with in the flesh? Let's read again. For the good that I would I do not, but, of the, but the evil which I would not that I do. I don't know about you, but it doesn't sound like control to me. What is he saying? That he is prone to do the opposite of what he wants to do. Now, to me, that sounds familiar. Maybe it sounds familiar to you also. If you're one person that's saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, it should really sound familiar. Because you will find yourself in the positions where you're, you're prone to do the opposite of what you want to do. And you'll wonder why you find yourselves in that position. But then, scroll down to verse 24. O wretched man that I am, whom shall deliver me from the body of this death? O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Once again, Paul doesn't sound like he has it all together there, does it? He doesn't sound that confident to me. He's asking a question. You compare these verses to what you see on religious television or the books that you read about the wealth and prosperity teachers. That lack of virus, they have infected our airwaves. They preach us the opposite. But Paul answers his own question here in verse 24 by immediately in verse 25 saying, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. What is Paul saying there? It's a lifelong battle. And only Jesus, and Jesus only, is the one that could deliver us from self. It was Jesus that said the flesh is weak. Don't forget that. So what I want to try to say, don't listen to the garbage that's out there that says that a person is not truly saved because they may sin or deny, deny the Lord at any particular moment. It's happened to... I just pointed out a few to, to you tonight. But it's happened throughout Scripture. One more. I think I gave you this verse. Matthew 11. I'm trying to drive this home so you get the point. I'm almost running out of time, so I've got to speed along here. Matthew 11. Verse 2. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ... This is the same John that baptized him and saw the glory come down that rested upon Jesus. Now when John heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples 
and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Think about that. What John experienced at that baptismal event should have been enough proof But what happens? He's sitting in that prison. You don't know what's going through his mind. There's moments of weakness because the flesh does take over. And even John, and it's pointed out in the scriptures, or do we look for another? Doubt has creeped in. Even in John the Baptist, I believe he became so discouraged while he was sitting in there in that prison and that's the reason why he sent his disciples out seeking Jesus to confirm if he really was the Christ we're all going to go through these type of difficulties in our life maybe some worse than others there's going to be valleys of this life that bring us to that point where the flesh becomes weak And like a trumpet, it starts declaring stupid things that gives others the opportunity in the self-righteous Christian world to point it out, point out to us that, oh, you're not saved. Because these times of discouragement, these times of weakness, these times of doubt, these times of denying, these times of being even maybe ashamed or cursing Christ. They're ready to point the fingers at you and can condemn you. I have preached it so many times, there is no, therefore no condemnation in Christ Jesus. I'm not saying if you find yourselves in those positions during your life, those places, that it makes it right, because it doesn't. But it does not mean that you're not saved either, is the point I'm trying to make. Salvation is of God. It is possible because what the Son of God did for us. It's not of man. We've never been able to obtain our salvation by our works. <coughs> and we don't keep it, that our salvation, because of the works we do. Works are part of rewards, if done correctly, by the way. I am far from perfect. But this I do know, that Jesus will not be ashamed of me. He will not let me down. even my weak moments of time. And when I get my head together, I start putting my trust in Him once again. Now go to Psalm 34. And I'll finish there. <clears throat> Verse Let you know as soon as I get there. Verse 22. This is another verse that's related to Romans 10 11. The, law, the Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. The moment you trust in Jesus to be your Savior, the promise is, unless you completely deny him and forsake him with the intent of never going back to him in any way or fashion or form, the promise is there that he will not desert you. You shall not be desolate. Psalm 34. 
Some Hebrew translations put, you shall not be guilty or punished. Well, I've heard preachers say just the opposite. Well, you know what? Stop listening to them. Is my advice. Stop listening to them. Because they're the same t preachers that would criticize and condemn the individuals that I've pointed out. David, 11 of the disciples, Joseph Marathia, John the Baptist, and that's just a starter. They were all been condemned to hell with no opportunity ever being saved by the self-righteous idiots out there that can't see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord means business. He does not go back in His Word and His promises that none of them that trust in Him shall be desolate. The moment you became saved, even if you fall, after the fact, he does not pack up his bags and moves out of this tent of human flesh. No, he's there. Now, he might put me through a few things to get my attention again, but he's there. Because the promise is he will never leave us nor forsake us. We might, like David, find ourselves in acts of insanity on occasion, but his promise is he will never leave us or forsake us. When you start analyzing all these stories, and you start analyzing all the scriptures, like I said in the beginning, the theme of what I'm saying tonight is there through and through, through the pages. So where do they get off on telling me? And where do they get off of misquoting scripture and taking it out of context? to act like self-righteous jerks. My trust is in Him. And I won't be desolate. I won't be guilty or punished because my Savior was on my behalf. And yours too. Now if you get that understanding, I want to hear from you, every single one of you, tonight. Play this song.